Lord, we just love you so much. Lord, we praise your name in this place. Lord, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for all that you are. I thank you, Jesus, for what you did in the service this morning. Lord, I thank you for the hearts you touched this afternoon. Lord, I I thank you for all the people that are here now that are here to worship you and to seek you and to know you and in spirit and in truth. Lord, I thank you and I praise you and I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team, all three of you. You know, I was, I was thinking, I, uh, I know I keep saying that I get to do this, and it's just so awesome. I, I get to be, I don't just get to be a pastor, I get to be the pastor at Bethel Assembly here in Grand Junction, and it just excites me. But, uh, when I went to general counsel, um, I went to general counsel, and, and the, the last message that was preached on Friday night, maybe one of these days I'll show you the whole thing, it was really great, but uh, the guy talked for, for a brief moment, well actually a lot of his message was about, um, it was geared towards pastors and the way that we preach, right, but Surely in here we've probably heard of the parable of the sower, right? And and some of the seed goes on the dry ground and some goes, you know, here, some goes there and, and all of the different things. And uh, and no matter what, we're preaching and we're letting the word go out, but we can't necessarily control all, always where it goes. And I've seen that over the years of different people that I've preached to, different groups that I've preached to, and... Um, and, and, and different opportunities that I've got. And it's really interesting to see how the word can impact one group and another group they don't budge. And I, and I was wondering, and I mean literally I was just sitting here earlier wondering, what is that? And the Lord reminded me about the message that was preached at General Council when the, the guy, he had a whole trough of dirt up on the stage. It was kind of cool. And, uh, but he said, you got to find the good soil because when you, bl- when you plant the seed in the good soil, you give the best opportunity for it to grow. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. I understand that. I want you to know that the Lord told me that you're the good soil. You're the good soil. I keep having all these people, they keep coming up to me, and and I'm just honored, and I'm blessed, and it's really hard to be humble when you get so many people that come up to you and tell you how awesome that you are. I'm really, I'm (laughs) I'm trying to be as humble as I can be, but today I had to wear my cowboy hat because I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I don't know, but... Um, But I have so many people that have been coming up to me and saying, we're so glad that you're our pastor. We're so glad that God sent you. We're so glad. We love the way that you're teaching, uh, you know, uh, and and all of this different stuff. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. But you don't understand the other way around and how much I love you guys and how awesome that you guys are and how receptive you've been to my preaching where I've preached to brick walls before. Now, there were actually people in the sanctuary but they were like preaching to a brick wall and so I want you to understand that you're good soil because you're ready not only to hear the word but to receive the word and grow in the word you're ready and God has put us all together for such a time as this I think it's awesome that's my mini pre-sermon I'm not going on another tangent all right, so tonight we're actually closing out with uh, the study I've been doing. I thought I had another week until I looked at the calendar and realized I was wrong. Um, I don't have another week, and I could split this in two and have us not pick it back up for four weeks, and then, yeah, no, I decided that that wouldn't be the best. So next Sunday night is the girls' ministries uh, celebration. We're excited about that. Some of the ladies are over there. Uh, right now, finishing off some of the 
the testing. And, and I, I misspoke this morning. My daughter is not getting the gold. She's getting the bronze. As long as she passes her test tonight, she gets the bronze. But I'm still just as proud of her because she wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't have come here. So I'm, I'm just excited for that. And then the following week is Labor Day weekend, and everybody seems to think they either got to go on vacation or something. I don't know. But we're going to have an awesome service, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit just fall in this place, and we're going to have a Holy Spirit barbecue. How about that? And, uh, and we'll all just be lit on fire and, and be excited for the Lord. But that Sunday evening, there's no service. And then the following week is uh, Missions Convention weekend. And for some of you, I don't know, how many of y'all have ever been a part of a missions convention? So, like, three of you. Okay, so, the missions convention, I just want you to know what it is. I, I guess maybe there's been some confusion of what missions convention is. So, sun, or Saturday evening, um, you typically have a guest speaker that comes. Um, this year we're having Malcolm Burleigh, and that's really awesome. Um, I know that most of y'all may not know who he is, but I do, and it's super cool. And uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so he's coming out, and so that night, we are going to, really what we're going to do is we're going to brag on you, because you're the church. You're the ones that give to the church through your tithes and offerings and everything, and we're going to talk about all the missionaries that we support and hopefully by then we'll have a list of all the missionaries and missions that we support and, and what we've given, uh, what we gave last year and missions and, and all of this. And we will uh, have a report. Basically, it's a night of going, look what God has done through us to support missions over the past year. And if you notice, Bryce and a few others have been working really hard at getting all these awesome posters up. And some of y'all are like, what are these people doing on our wall? Well, these are representations of the people groups in all of the different countries all over the world. And, um, and some of them we have missionaries in that we support and others we don't. And so, but the missions convention is to get us focused on missions. And then we will do something that's called faith promises. And I'll teach you all about that at the mission convention so that I can get to my sermon. And, uh, but you want to be here for that. So a lot of people thought, uh, someone thought it was like a night of worship. Well, it is in a way because we're going to be talking about how we've worshiped God in our giving to missions over the past year. It's going to be great. And then the su Saturday or Sunday morning will be basically kind of a continuance of that. And uh, Malcolm will preach Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, we have the Scots that will be here to share with us what God's been doing with them over the past few years. And we're just going to have everything about that weekend um, is going to be mission focused. Now, I know that there are ladies that on Saturday morning are doing a scavenger hunt. And we want to make sure, but they're all going to be on a mission, aren't they? So it's still mission focused. Um, <laughs> but y'all are going to have a great time. I think some of the missionary wives and some others may even join in um, and uh, be a part of that scavenger hunt. I don't know all the details. You got to talk to uh, Marsha, I think. Is that right? Yes. Marsha knows what she's doing. Yes. yes. All right. So when in doubt, ask me. And if I don't know, ask Marsha. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, we have been going over this series, of course, called uh, the uh, Operation of the Holy Spirit, because we know that there's more to the Holy Spirit than just speaking in tongues, right? There's so much more to the Holy Spirit than just speaking in tongues, and, um, but so many churches put the focus on that as if it's, that's the end-all, be-all of, of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has way more to offer than the little box of speaking in tongues. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not exciting or awesome. It just means that there's more to it. And Paul even tells us to aspire for the greater gifts. You know, we get so wrapped up in this cool little thing of speaking in tongues. You speak in tongues? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of cool that way. Uh, but, but what we need is to aspire for the better things. And so... Um, I've taken the last two that I had kind of split in half and put these together, and so I'm going to do my best to cover it all in at least an hour and a half. So I'll probably get done faster than that. 
Um, but y'all don't even care anyway. You're all like, hey, let's study the Bible, right? Uh, most of y'all are that way. <laughs> but um, so we're going to try and finish this. So let's get started. A gift. A gift of the Holy Spirit is an ability, whether used in just a moment or something continually, continually used, such as a talent. Now, I know I've already said some of this, but maybe some of y'all weren't here, and there's nothing wrong with refreshing your mind, right? Okay, so it is a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Is, uh, there is the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that's when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that's where we come up with the initial physical evidence speaking in tongues and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit but when we talk about gifts of the Holy Spirit they are different functions and operations that happen within the church some of them are possessions and some of them are momentary uses and there's a difference and so we talked a little bit last week but there's basically two kinds of gifts of the Holy Spirit, the momentary gift or the continual gift. A momentary gift example is like healing. Some people operate in, in a healing ministry, but that doesn't mean that everybody they lay their hands on gets healed. They don't possess the gift of healing. It is a momentary thing. They may see a lot of people healed in their ministry, um, but that doesn't mean they possess it. But a teacher is a continual gift. Typically, a teacher is somebody that's going to teach you, and uh, my wife is a teacher. Um, and sometimes, well, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead here for just a second. Sometimes pastors are preachers, and sometimes pastors are teachers, and very few are, are teachers and preachers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're fortunate. Um, <laughs> so, because uh, depending on um, how you can listen to somebody speak can really make a huge difference in how you uh, can be receptive of what's being taught. So, um, but here's the gifts listed in various locations throughout the New Testament. Continual gifts, gifts of leadership, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, helps, administration, and leadership. Gifts of practical assistance, generous giving, mercy. And then there's momentary gifts. There's gifts of revelation, which would be words of wisdom or word of knowledge. Um, gifts of power, which are healing, faith, and miracles. And then there's gifts of worship. Now, you can categorize them however you'd like to. This is just how I've put it together, okay? Um, but uh, gifts of worship, this would be speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and discerning of spirits. And, and I don't think I need to recover uh, what discerning of the spirits is at this moment. We'll cover it a little bit more in depth in a few minutes. So, Let's take a little bit closer look. So I would split the two categories up between this week and next week, but we're going to do them all tonight. So um, Romans 12, 4 through 8, it says this, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who con uh, contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, and then... Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, Also has apostles, helps, and administration which fall together in exhorting... Uh, excuse me, I'm, that's not even up there. Uh, and God has uh, appointed the, in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And so there's lots of different things that are all compounded together in different parts. And so this has the apostles, helps, administration, and they fall together in exhorting or serving. Serving. And we're going to come back to that. So, so here's these gifts. The gift of leadership. A gift of leadership. Apostles. Well, what's an apostle? Well, that name can be thrown around a lot, can it? Um, generally, we consider an apostle in the Bible someone that had a physical encounter with the living Christ. 
Um, but in today's, an apostle is really just a person that is preaching the gospel. A leader that is preaching the gospel, probably over a large group. Um, there's a lot of people that walk around and they say, I'm the apostle John so-and-so. But they don't even have a large group. Um, I would say that apostles would fall more into folks like a gen, the general superintendent of the Sims of God or district superintendents. Those kind of folks that they are in the charge of a large group. And they're constantly in prayer of how to guide and direct the large group. And so, um, but an apostle is someone who's truly gifted with a special walk with Christ. They are not your typical pastor or evangelist, but one who truly leads the movement of the gospel. Helping to get the message to the world, mentor, train, and lead while fully walking in the Spirit. Just because someone claims this position or title does not make it so. I've, I've met some folks that were self-proclaimed evangelists. And I'm like, hmm. Had a young man one time that came to me, told me that God had called him to be an evangelist. And I believed him. 100%. Boy was on fire for God. I gave him an opportunity to preach at my church. Because he was coming to my church. I gave, he got up to preach. And he preached his heart out. Didn't say a thing. I don't even know if he referenced scripture one time. He did a lot of shouting. He did a lot of saying stuff. The people were shouting with him. But there was no, there was no root to what he was saying. And then I told him, I said, you need, to, you need to get a little bit of training. Maybe go through school of ministry or go through some a little bit of schooling so that you can have a little more depth to what you're saying. And he told me, I don't need no schooling. And I said, well, let's take a look at that for just a second. Did God um, send anybody to university? I've heard a lot of people say that there is nowhere in the Bible where it says you've got to have a, a degree to be able to preach the gospel. And I will say amen to that. Because you're looking at a man that does not have a degree. I have a diploma in ministerial studies. Whatever that means. The tests I took were all really easy, if that matters. But they weren't to some people. I watched some people that really struggled through the tests that, that we had to take. But for me, and my walk with the Lord and my study of the Word, they weren't that difficult. But, but did, did God take anybody through schooling? Did Jesus take anybody through schooling? Let's think about it for just a second. Who are those 12 guys that walked around with him for three and a half years? Huh. He sent them out to do some work once in a while, didn't he? But for three and a half years, those guys walked around and watched Jesus do what Jesus was doing. And then whenever Jesus went into heaven, he said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit because you all still didn't get it. And I'm going to empower you to go and be my witnesses to the whole world. And they went through three and a half years of training before they did it. What about Paul? Well, Paul just had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then all of a sudden he was preaching the gospel. Well, one, Paul was very well learned in the Old Testament, in the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a man of God, just on the wrong mission. But what happened to him when he had an encounter with Jesus? Did he just all of a sudden start going out and preaching to the masses? No, if you look in Galatians chapter 1, you'll find that he went into the wilderness and was with Jesus for three years before he went on his missions to start preaching the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that God has instituted a three-year university, but what, and I don't think that you have to have any type of schooling to preach your testimony to people. But if you're going to be an evangelist preacher or teacher, you better know what you're teaching. And maybe some schooling would be a good idea. Because if uh, Jesus thought the apostles needed it, hmm. I've had people tell me before that they didn't think they needed to be baptized. So Jesus didn't either, but he did it anyway. Right? 
So sometimes what we need to do is look at the biblical model. Oh wait, not sometimes. We should always look at the biblical model of how things work and then work our model off of what the Bible says and not what we think it should be. Right? Because I fully believe that that young man I talked about if he had had a little more depth in what he was saying and a little more training, if he had went to school and got to know some of those people that were going to school with him, it would have opened doors for him to be able to go to places he never thought he'd be able to go and do things he never thought he'd be able to do and preach to people he never thought he'd be able to preach to. But to this day, he still hasn't done it. I was stubborn too. I didn't want to go to school. But my wife, you know, my wife has asked me before, why do you love me so much? And I'm like, well, you're kind of pretty. I like that. And then she really knows how to motivate me and get me encouraged to go do things. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. And, and, and so I shared some of that all this morning, but it, it's just the truth. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked and I'm going to run out of time. So prophets, preachers. Pastors, gifts of leadership. A New Testament prophet is not necessarily the same as an Old Testament prophet. Old Testament prophets were a specific person called by God, and they normally came with bad news. <laughs> Have you ever read the Old Testament? How many of those guys were coming proclaiming, yay? <laughs> they usually showed up. Why was it everybody was so afraid of the prophet coming to town? Yeah, get away from that guy. All he brings is bad news. God's going to strike us down. Right? So a modern-day prophet, a New Testament prophet, isn't one that's bringing doom and gloom. He is one that is bringing the message of the gospel into the marketplace. Um, he preaches the word of God. Is a prophet to prophesy in the New Testament literally just means to preach the word of God. So a modern-day prophet, okay, now I'm not claiming to be an Old Testament prophet, okay, but would be someone like me, that I prophesy, I preach the Word of God because that's what God has given me to do. I'm a pastor in, in an office of similar to the New Testament prophet that preaches the Word of God. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming to be... Old Testament prophet like those guys. I'm just saying that according to the New Testament, that's what a prophet is. And really, a prophet is closer to an evangelist than what we would call an evangelist today. Evangelists come into town, preach an on-fire message, and then they move on to the next town, right? And more of your New Testament prophets did things like that, what we would call the office of evangelist. Um, because the office of evangelist in the New Testament is actually someone that goes out into the towns and the highways and the byways in a specific town and preaches the gospel in the marketplace. Some people can hold the multiple title of Pastor, prophet, evangelist, all kinds of different things. But these things are gifts of leadership. It is not, a prophet is not necessarily someone who gives a future prophecy, but rather someone that teaches God's word through his guidance, even when it's not popular. We are in a time where the hungry are seeking the word of God. But the rest of the world, to the rest of the world, the Word of God is not popular. If you think about what's going on in Afghanistan, I got word this week that all of our workers, we'll just call them that because this is live, all of our workers were rescued out of Afghanistan. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not many by the thousands that are being hunted down because they are proclaiming Christ and they've given their life to Jesus. They are in harm's way. So it said, an evangelist, the term evangelist means one who takes a message to the marketplace. Pastors, teachers, 
Um, there are pastors that can teach and pastors that can preach. I said that, but only a rare few can do both. You can decide which one that I am. However, it's important, it is an important gift that God uses to make sure that not only is his word heard, but it is better understood. Now, if you get a preacher that comes along and he never uses scripture in what he's saying, see those doors over there? That's where he needs to go. Um, or somebody needs to take him back to some of that three and a, three and a half years of schooling <laughs> so he can start uh, exhorting the Word of God rather than just preaching topics. Um, and so it, we, we have to have Scripture. The purpose of the pastors and teachers is to help us to better understand what Scripture says. Not everybody is called to get into the Greek and the Hebrew and, and know what the word ruark means or pneuma or whatever, but the pastors and teachers can get in and do the study and then deliver the message. That's why Scripture tells us, and, and you can think this or not, but Scripture tells us that pastors and teachers are held to a higher standard than everyone else. We are doubly, doubly accountable for what we say and what we do. And I've had to learn over the years that even something I can say in joking can be taken in offense and hurt somebody. And I don't ever want to hurt anybody. So if what I say can t be taken in a way that it hurts your feelings or a way that won't hurt your feelings, I meant the one that didn't hurt your feelings. All right? Unless it's convicting and leading you to the cross, then I for sure meant to hurt your feelings. All right, so that's a good rule of thumb. Exhortation. These are helps or administration gifts. These all fit together really as church support. The apostles, prophets, and evangelists are to be constantly in the word and prayer to make sure they are delivering the word the way God wants it. You know, I, I had a whole sermon this morning ready to go, and one of these days I might preach it. But if I hadn't been in tune with the heart of God this morning, I would have just got up and preached what I had written instead of the way that God directed me. And it wouldn't have impacted a few of the lives that we may not have had a big massive altar call, but as uh, Brother Jack mentioned, that after service, I had multiple people coming up to me and wanted to talk to me individually and tell me about things going on in their life and wanted prayer. And it was powerful and awesome what God did this morning. But if it wasn't for folks that were able to hang out and make sure everything else was taken care of, I would have missed out on being able to be in tune with what God wanted to do. If my focus would have been on other things. And so the exhortation ministries are people that are, that are appointed or, or have abilities like deacons. Deacons' jobs. Listen, deacons. <laughs> this is scripture, okay? It's not just me trying to... Uh, get your gourd but deacons jobs are to uplift and support the needs of the church and uplift and support the pastor and the direction God has given him as long as he's going in the direction that God is actually leading him but they but they take care of duties like finances building problems um, we've had some awesome deacons over this past week that saved us what ten thousand dollars and door replacements that we didn't have to have done because we had a company come out and said, oh yeah, you got to replace these doors. And what was it? I mean, a threshold that needed to be bent and put back into place and uh, about an hour or so's worth of work and some drilling out and now the doors work just fine. And it didn't cost $10,000. Thank you, deacons, <laughs> for doing that. All right. Um, but they're also supposed to be there for church discipline prayer and many other things that ministers would need help with also folks like our groundskeepers our janitors the church secretary and all those others fall into helps in administration they're folks that make sure that the function of the body continues on 
Some folks are gifted with the ability to lead even if they don't want it. I mentioned this last week. John Maxwell says in his 21 Levels of Leadership that the leader isn't always the person in charge, and if you happen to be the one put in charge, find the natural leader of the group, get them on board with what you're trying to do. That way when you present it to the group, when they look to the person and he agrees with you, they will follow. Some folks just walk into a room and everyone looks to them as the leader. It's a gift. It can be nerve-wracking. I love it when I walk into a room and everyone does not look at me to be the leader. Because it seems to be everywhere that I have ever went. I walk into a group and nobody wants to step up and say anything. And everybody knows me. I'm not afraid to say anything. And so I start talking and I end up being the guy that everybody wants to. They want them to make the decision from everything of where are we going to dinner tonight, what's going to be on the pizza, to what direction should we go in this ministry. And I just wish that somebody could decide on dinner first. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it's just the way that it works. But some people are that way. They're the one that everyone looks to. And so if you get put in charge of a ministry, find that guy. Unless you are that guy, then feel blessed. <clears throat> then there's gift of practical assistance, generous giving. Some folks are not only blessed with the ability to give, but a generous heart. As I studied this, I found one commentary said that this wasn't talking about normal giving, but rather a person would give so much it would almost be considered silly to the rest of us. Crazy giving. Why do you give so much? <laughs> do you know, I read about J.C. Penney. And was it J.C. Penney or Montgomery Ward? Was it J.C. Penney? Somebody knows the story I'm going to tell. That back in the beginning, he was a diehard, faithful man of God. And he decided that instead of giving 10%, and living on 90%, he was going to give 90% and live on 10%. And look what happened to his business. Of course, he's not alive anymore. And I'm going to guess that they don't operate on that uh, philosophy any longer. And look what happened to their business. When we put God first in our giving, people will look at us. Why do you give so much to the church? Let me tell you what God has given me. That's a good way to start with an answer. And God has given me eternal life through Jesus. Jesus paid the price for me. <laughs> Giving what little I'm able to give is nothing compared to what Jesus did for me. Then there's people that have a gift of mercy. Having a heart of mercy is someone who can truly come alongside even in the hardest of circumstances and show love and grace. Compassion and mercy ministries that we have in the Assemblies of God are groups like Convoy of Hope and Teen Challenge. They, uh, Convoy of Hope, whenever uh, the, uh, hurricane, one of the hurricanes was hitting the Gulf in Texas, they sat right outside of the storm. They waited. When the storm hit, there were tons of trucks. And boom, they went right in to start helping to get people fed, tons of water, everything they could. They beat FEMA, which probably wasn't hard to do. But anyway, they, they were in there ministering to the people with compassion. Team Challenge, what an amazing organization. They take men and women, many of them looking at going to prison for a long time, and they say, give them to us and let us give them some Jesus and see what happens. And they have a really good success rate. It's more than three times what any other secular rehab can do. The difference when you immerse them in Christ, it makes all the difference. When you have compassion, not just to get somebody clean, 
but to give somebody hope. It makes all the difference. There's so much. There's so many people. And you don't have to be a part of a big organization. You know, we have, we have ladies uh, in our church that are constantly passing around prayer needs. And, and we've got a few that are leading that and heading that up. And they're making sure now that I know what the prayer needs are so that I can stop and I can pray. But I'm going to tell you that just having those prayers, that is an amazing act of mercy. Being somebody that can call someone every day and talk to them and make them feel wonderful, even though they're in the hardest of circumstance. What an amazing gift that is. Then there's the spiritual gifts, the momentary gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, it says this. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except they're in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between or discern spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Not how we wills. <laughs> how he wills so let's cover them gifts of revelation a word of wisdom a word of knowledge gifts of power healing faith and miracles gifts of worship speaking in tongues interpretation of tongues prophecy and discerning of spirit spirits as i said earlier these gifts are momentary gifts that god may use a, uh, a particular person in a lot but they are not an on-demand possession of the person for example many people will say they have the gift of discernment that would be an incorrect statement. God may give you the ability in many cases discern, to discern the correctness of a spiritual gift, the spirituality of an individual, or if there is a demonic or angelic presence around, but most people cannot do it on call. Those that can fall into a whole different category that we're not going to in-depth tonight. <laughs> That's a whole another ball of wax. There are some people that God has opened their eyes to see things in the spiritual realm that would scare most of us half to death. And they are very rare, and they're typically very odd individuals. I happen to know one. And he is one of my, a great friend of mine. But, man, the guy's strange. And if he's watching tonight, he knows I'm talking about him. <laughs> He watches too. I love you, Nevin. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. But whew, he told us he's 50-some years old, and he said that we adopted him. He's one of our kids. Oh, I'm 45. I've been for a whole week. Actually, not even a whole week. <laughs> so uh, anyway. but <laughs> So if God's given you that gift, uh, if God has given you the gift of the ability to preach, teach, and the like, you can almost use that gift at any moment. Um, and if you can just come into my office for about five minutes for discussion, you'll quickly find out that I have a gift of preaching on demand at any moment. So, but let's cover these nine spiritual gifts. And uh, I got about 30 seconds, so... Uh, we're going to get through them really fast. I hope none of you are in a really big hurry, but we're going to get these done. One more thing. Spiritual gifts will be supernatural and will in many cases work in conjunction with other gifts, such as tongues for interpretation. You don't give a... If, 
tongues, your spiritual prayer language, that initial physical evidence, that, that prayer language that God gives you, praying in the Spirit and with understanding, that kind of thing, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about tongues for interpretation. You do not give tongues without interpretation in a service. And just so you know, if God gives you the tongues, He's also going to give you the interpretation. It is not someone else's responsibility to give the interpretation for you. Now, some people, we have a gift of tongues over here, and the person over here gives interpretation, and that is good. But if the other person that's supposed to give the interpretation is not willing, you should be ready because you gave the tongues. And it's not my responsibility to do the interpretation, but sometimes God will give me that. But, um, but tongues and interpretation are gifts that go together. You can't interpret without tongues, can you? And if you take tongues and interpretation, you smash them together, you get prophecy. But prophecy is just the message without the tongues. Right? So words of wisdom... Gifts of revelation, something that you would not know under normal circumstances. Ah, let me try that again. A gift of revelation is something that you would not know under normal circumstances. So a word of wisdom is to give instruction or guidance in someone's life, not from experience or because you know the situation they're going through, but that God has given you instruction to give them. The best example is when you don't know what's going on, but you know what to tell them they're supposed to do. Somebody comes up to you, I, if, if I ask you, when I come up to pray for you, if I ask you, what can I pray for you with? It's because I don't know. But sometimes, I, and I love it better this way, when somebody walks up to me and they want prayer, and I start praying... I love it when I pray for somebody and they go, how did you know that? I didn't. <laughs> God did. You know? And so um, words of knowledge is very similar. To know something about someone's life, you would have no way of knowing. Remember, Jesus knew the details of the life of the woman at the well and he gave her wise instruction on how to receive living water. There's gifts of power. Gifts... Uh, it gives you a temporary supernatural ability to do something or be used for something to happen. Healing. This is pretty self-explanatory, but just in case. This is not healing by a doctor. That is a miracle. But a gift of healing would be an instantaneous or it may be something that takes a day or so as God is beginning to mend you back together, but not because the hands of the doctor touched you. Um, it uh, but doesn't mean that God doesn't use doctors, okay? I've run into those crew of people that somebody gets injured real bad, they won't go to the hospital because God's going to heal them. Go to the hospital. Maybe you need a cast, and that's how God's going to heal you. But somebody comes up and they have cancer, and I lay hands on them, and then they come back a week later, and they don't have cancer. The truth rally starts in about an hour, where Bill and I are going tomorrow. And last year, a man came to the truth rally. He didn't even ask for prayer. Somebody was led over to pray for him. He had a big tumor on his head. Prayed for him. The next day, it fell off. We got pictures. I showed Bill just the other day. <laughs> I said, look, here you go. And he's like, wow, that's, you, you can't even tell. The guy had this on his head. And the, the, the thing on his head was probably, I know you can't see very well up here, but it was pretty good size. It just fell off. That's a, that is healing. You know, faith. The more you draw close to God, your faith in Him will be built. But this Holy Spirit gift is a special faith in a moment or situation that requires you to push past normal faith in God. Remember when Jesus prayed in the garden before He was arrested? He asked God that if it were possible to let the coming events not happen. Jesus asked that of God. If it were possible. But I believe that God strengthened his faith. Now I'm going to explain that in just a little bit. Hopefully we can get it done here in a couple minutes. Miracles. Healing is a miracle, but so is walking on water. 
This is why miracles are listed separate. And as I said a bit ago, many of the gifts work together. So healing is a miracle, but not all miracles are healings. You know, uh, you have somebody walks up to you and you're going through the, 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 the worst time in your life financially. Somebody walks up to you and gives you exact dollar amount of what you needed to pay a bill. That's a miracle. But you weren't healed. Right? <laughs> well, maybe you were. I don't know. <laughs> but, all right, so then there's gifts of worship. These gifts may be personal or corporate, but are designed to draw people into a closer walk in the Lord. Remember, worship is not the song we sing, but the life we live in the Lord. Speaking in tongues. Gifts of tongues is, a spe- is speaking in a language you do not know. There are some people that have a gift of languages and they can learn languages and understand languages and all of that. But the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues is speaking in a language you do not know and have not learned. Um, I had a, um, my friend Pastor Phil talked about one time uh, at his Bethel that they had a message of tongues interpretation and after the service this Russian man that was there visiting came up to him and said, um, how does that person over there know Russian? And Phil says, uh, he doesn't. That was a gift of tongues and interpretation. He's like, I still, I don't understand. The man over here gave a message in Russian, and the lady over there interpreted it exactly what the other man had said. And Phil says, oh, yeah, so that was for you. Because... <laughs> It was a gift of tongues. That man did not know Russian. God gave him that gift. Now, that doesn't mean that God always has people speak in Russian or Spanish or whatever. They don't know. Sometimes it's a heavenly language we have no idea. But the gift of tongues is a language you do not know. Um, and so it's not the same as your personal tongues. It's not the same as your worship, but it's similar in sound. Because when you're praying in the Spirit... That's for you. Um, and uh, when you're praying for tongues interpretation, that's different. Uh, interpretation of tongues. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to really dwell on that. If you don't know what interpretation of tongues is, we've got issues. All right. Prophecy. <laughs> this is a corporate word given by God through an individual with or without tongues. A plus B equals C, but you don't have to have A plus B to get C, right? So uh, when I say A plus B, uh, tongues interpretation equals prophecy. But prophecy is not, you don't have to have the other two to have a gift of prophecy. So basically, uh, well, sorry, some prophecies may be foretelling, like Jesus saying he would die and be raised from the dead. But more are just a word of encouragement, correction, or instruction given to the group. In some cases, an entire nation or the world. And then there's that fancy discerning of spirits. We covered it a little bit, but just to, uh, just to give a Jesus example, Jesus came to the man that had a, the legion of demons. He was able to discern that they were demons. They knew exactly who he was, and that's a whole other sermon. So you might ask why I give Jesus examples for most of these. Other than tongues, which is not mentioned in the Gospels that Jesus spoke in other tongues, um, Jesus fully operated in the Holy Spirit. Jesus was God in the flesh, but remember, he set his deity to the side and became fully man. We cannot comprehend that he could be 100% man and 100% God at the same time. But he had set apart his deity as the one of the parts of the Trinity, and had become separate. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to go pray. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to happen, have this event happen. You notice, if you look in Scripture, the first miracle that Jesus ever did was not until after this event. In Luke 3, 21 and 22, it says this, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying... 
the heavens open were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. What just happened? Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then from that moment forward, he operated fully in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why when Jesus walked up to somebody, he would know exactly what was going on in their lives. It was not just because he was God in the flesh. It was because he was the living example of walking fully in the Spirit and knowing how to work in all of the gifts of the Spirit. And Jesus said this, These things I do and greater will you do when I leave and send you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has told us that we can operate fully in the power of the Holy Spirit, but the way we have to do it is we've got to set ourselves to the side and let God just pour out into our lives. And sometimes that means, oh wait, all the time, that means that we got to separate ourselves completely from the world. In the book of James, it says, a true and undefiled religion. One of my pet peeves, I'll throw this out there to you, uh, because some of you have said it to me, and it's okay. I don't hold grudges or anything like that. But one of my pet peeves is when people say, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Absolutely. It's both. It said in, in James somewhere, 1, 5, I think it is, somewhere along the lines of there, it says, a true an undefiled relationship. Nope, that's not what it says. It says a true and undefiled religion is this, to be unspotted from the world and to take care of the widows and the orphans. The end, period. <laughs> a true and undefiled religion. Why was it years ago everybody said, I got religion? The word we use for religion today does not mean the same thing it did 50 years ago, and it does not mean the same thing that was interpreted into the King James Version, and it does not mean the same thing that they used in the Greek. Because <laughs> the word religion today means all these other things. It means trying to work to God, it means being a Hindu, it means being a Muslim, whatever. But the true an undefiled religion of Jesus Christ is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in such a way that it keeps you unspotted from the world and that everything that you are will do everything that you can to serve the people, especially those that are in the deepest of need, the widows and the orphans. That's what the Bible says. I used to have the shirt. I had a t-shirt that said, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. The problem is, is it's both. It's both. The relationship is part of the religion. Because you can't have the true undefiled religion without the relationship. And you can't have the relationship without the religion. It's just the truth. And all of it goes together. That if we will stay unspotted from the world, not on our own efforts, but because, as I said this morning, we'll stop running and we'll start receiving what God has. We'll stop trying to do what God wants us to do and start being a receptor. How many, how many of y'all have been around long enough you remember the TVs with the rabbit ears? You know? And you had to wrap some foil around it, smack it on the side a couple of times. You ever met some Christians like that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just want to smack them on the side a couple of times and see if that will give them a better signal, right? <laughs> Tell them, put your hands in the air. <laughs> put your receptors up and start receiving what God has. So many of us walk around with our fists closed like this and we wonder why we can't receive anything. 
How can God give you something when your hands aren't open? How can you receive when your hands are busy? Oh, that doesn't mean you don't work for God. But if your receptors aren't receiving, you're not getting what God's trying to give you. And you're not ever going to have the undefiled religion. You're not ever going to have the motivation to live for God the way that you need to. And you're never going to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit and be able to work in the full operation of the Holy Spirit and do the greater things as long as you're in the way. So quit running. Quit trying. Start receiving. Then you'll know what to do and how to do it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I think I'm done. If I'm not, there's probably more in there, but we'll get to that to another day. How many of y'all are ready to do some receiving tonight? You see, God set us apart, and this is our last one until September. This is it. It's the last Sunday night that we'll meet together like this until the middle of September. And then the focus is going to switch from getting ready for missions and just the operational uh, learning about the operation of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be time for us to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we're not going to do it if we're not receiving. We're not going to receive if we don't stop running. And we're not going to get any of it if we don't get to the altars and pray. If we don't pray, the revival we're planning is just going to be a couple days of a good preacher coming to preach and sing some songs. And it'll be fun. And we'll do some shouting. But he'll go on back to Oklahoma and we'll be the same. I don't want to be the same. I want to be the same. I want to be touched and changed in Jesus' name. I want to be touched by the Holy Spirit, not just by some preacher coming and preaching some good messages and singing some good songs. I want to be touched by the Holy Spirit in everything that we do from now until then and everything we do from then until after. In Jesus' name. So will you come and let's join this one more time and let's pray. Thank you, Jesus.